Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Himmelstein. Uh, thanks for coming. I want to talk to you today about Manubot, which is a software tool we've been building, uh, which is a way for writing papers, and our hope is that a lot of uh, what we're doing with this product can be adopted by other products and can really show what a publication system of the future may look like. So what is Manubot? It's a system for writing papers uh, using Git and GitHub. Uh, our goal is to power the next generation of scholarly manuscript with a few uh, goals, such as being transparent and reproducible, uh, having publication be immediate and permissionless, versioned and automated, collaborative, and open and free of charge. And we think our prototype achieves these goals to a large extent. So let me get started. Each uh, manuscript you make will have a repository. Uh, for those not familiar with repositories, it's just essentially a folder with uh, the content of that manuscript. Uh, so this is what the repository looks like for uh, something which we codename the meta review, which is a, a manuscript which describes the Manubot. So the manuscript describing the Manubot, of course, is written with Manubot. <laughs> and uh, what a user does to create this is they uh, do things in the content directory. Uh, so there is text files or markdown files, which is a way of having uh, formatting, formatting of text. And uh, here's an example shown of a, a markdown file. And another file that's interesting is this metadata.yaml file, uh, where you put in things like the title and author information. One goal of Manubot is to uh, avoid repetition. So for example, once an author is added to this metadata file, that determines the authorship everywhere. And never again do you need to type their name. Um, to print their name at some part in the paper. Uh, so here's a little bit more about the mechanics of how it works. Uh, you track your paper using Git. Git is a version control system which can keep track of how files change over time. Here, this is showing a single change of uh, uh, two words. So date added was changed to time added. This is a small typo fix, uh, but you can see exactly who did it. I did this on July 21st. And what happens after that change is made is something called continuous integration rebuilds the manuscript. So there's a server which is monitoring for whenever the manuscript changes. And if it detects a change, it then remakes the manuscript and uh, deploys it back to GitHub. Uh, so what this means is from when a change happens to when essentially it's republished with the change in a pretty formatted way is a matter of a few minutes. Uh, another aspect, since we use continuous integration, it can do uh, sort of any sort of task you want it to do. One task we have it do is timestamp manuscripts on the Bitcoin blockchain, such that you know this version of the manuscript existed at that specific date and time, which could be helpful uh, if there were ever an authorship dispute or someone said, well, you've revised your paper after the fact. You could say, no, we can prove the paper existed then. Uh, so since this is force, uh, I have the beyond the PDF slide, which was the uh, original slogan of this conference. And the primary output of Manubot is an HTML view. Uh, so if you go to that URL, you will see a Manubot created manuscript. And it looks something like this. And it's all customizable, uh, such that you could change this display if you wanted to. Another thing I want you to notice is this uh, string of seemingly random characters. This is what's called a commit hash, and this is the commit of the source that went to make this manuscript. So if you go to that link, it will always bring you to the specific version that was um, shown here. If you get rid of those numbers, it will go to the latest version. Uh, so in this way, every version of the manuscript that ever existed is preserved. A little bit about uh, the technologies that this project pieces together. So you write your manuscript in Markdown. 
there is a Python program called Manubot Process, which uh, uses Jinja to do some templating. I'll explain that later. Uh, it also gathers citation information using something called citation styles language. And the main thing that we use is Pandoc to go from the markdown to an HTML output, the main output I showed you, and a docx output, which um, is unfortunately sometimes still needed to submitting to jur journals. Although eventually we'd like Manubot to get to a point where um, we don't have to go to a lossy format. Uh, like docx in this case. Uh, and then from the HTML, we create the PDF. Uh, so th this is how sort of the going from markdown to PDF works. And uh, when that's automated online, uh, people often use GitHub to store the manuscript, although conceivably you could use GitLab. Uh, and currently we use Travis CI to do the continuous integration and GitHub pages to host the manuscripts. So one, I guess, main reason we built Manubot is so that we could use an open source software workflow of issues, pull requests, and open peer review online uh, for writing manuscripts. So here is how it works. Um, on the left-hand side, you have a document. And in purple, a contributor or potential contributor comes, reads the document, and has a question or concern uh, or wants to get involved. So they create an issue to discuss it, and other participants or maintainers uh, reply and discuss with them about their concern or feedback. So in this case, I'm showing you uh, for a project called the Deep Review, Zietz M opened an issue and said he would like to add a section on protein-protein interactions. And then uh, below, several people end up discussing that, and it's decided that it's a good idea, and he gets to go ahead to um, write that section. So the way that you propose a section is through something which is called the pull request, where you're proposing to change the source of the manuscript. And oftentimes, that will have several um, rounds of review from participants and maintainers. And if all goes well, eventually a maintainer will accept that and merge the change back in, at which point it becomes an official part of the manuscript. And then uh, the manuscript is rebuilt with that change included. And so in this case, that ended up happening. Uh, Zietzem made a pull request, which got included. Uh, so if you look at how the manuscript changes over time, uh, you can see who added what when. This is called the commit history. And for this deep review project, you can see uh, many different authors contributing online. One thing that's cool is this can enable massively parallel forms of writing and uh, review, which other types of authoring systems may have difficulty scaling to. One thing that uh, we've spent a lot of time on is the idea of citation by persistent identifier. This is the idea that rather than having to put bibliographic details in a file and then uh, putting that in your authoring software, when you write, you can just put an identifier to a paper. So for example, you would write this sentence in the Manubot source, and it's this is a sentence with five citations. The first one's a DOI, a digital object identifier. The second one's a PubMed ID, then a PubMed central ID, then an archive ID, and then a URL. And Manubot would automatically um, gather the metadata from different resources and render it as this is a sentence with five citations, one, two, three, four, five, and then the bibliography would show one, and it would have the metadata, and so on. And all this can be done today without the user having to tell anything but the ID of the study. So we've also spent some time trying to modernize the style of the bibliography. So this is what our default uh, bibliography format looks like uh, compared to, say, what my uBiome Smart Gut Report had. I like it more when you can see the title. Um, you have standard identifiers with these old style citations, it's even hard to know exactly what was cited. And we omit things like page numbers and volumes uh, because we think most readers nowadays are electronic 
and if you have a link, that suffices. But you don't have to like this style because Manubot very easily allows you to choose from uh, thousands of styles. We use something called citation style language, and here you can see there are many pre-existing styles for different journals. Uh, so really, you just have to plug in which style you want to use. No more messing around with reformatting bibliographies manually. Since a lot of this citation infrastructure we think is useful for um, not just users of people or of manu bot manuscripts, we've made a command line utility called um, manubot site, and you can install it via PyPy. It's a Python package. Here's a little terminal recording showing you what it could do. Uh, so now we're asking for the version, but the first command we're going to do is to get the metadata uh, for a standard identifier. So it's uh, manubot site and then a URL. And these commands here are just so it shows up in a pretty way with colors. <laughs> uh, so there we've got in the CSL JSON data. Uh, which may be useful to some people, but potentially more useful is rendering those citations. So we are going to go manubot site and tell it to render and then put in the five IDs. And now it took a little time because it got all that metadata and generated the bibliography. And obviously if that's not the style you want, you can tell it to switch to another style. So here we specify the CSL command and put it in the nature communication style. Here are the details of which um, APIs we use to get this metadata, uh, if you're interested. Uh, one thing that we did, which is helpful, is that some of the APIs, such as Crossref, can return uh, CSL that has way too many fields. It's not actually valid CSL. Uh, so this, I'm showing you all the things it returns, a small portion of which is valid but 90% is not. Uh, so we use the JSON schema to essentially prune or remove invalid fields, uh, making it much more compact and making it less likely to break uh, downstream processors. So here are some aspects, kind of random aspects that I find important about Manubot. Um, one is end, the idea of end-to-end -end reproducibility, which is the concept that the provenance of every statement, measure, and figure can be traced back to its origin in a paper. So for example, we recommend that when users are embedding figures in their paper, they should use versioned links to the source repository that created that figure. So for example, this is marked down to embed an SVG image, and if you notice, we're linking to the GitHub repository that created it using a commit hash such that um, there's no ambiguity of where that figure came from and what computational process or process otherwise created it. Another thing we allow is templating. So you can directly insert output uh, using template variables. So in yellow here, um, you're saying look up these variables in a file which you have to pass to Manubot. And then when you run Manubot, you would uh, pass this JSON file which has these measures from the output of, of a previous process. So for example, it would say the deep review repository accumulated and then it would look up total commits, 755 git commits. And this uh, removes the possibility that you could be pulling results from you know, different versions of the analysis or you could make a typo when typing in a result into the paper. So the results are directly coming from the analysis when this is set up. In the future, we want our manuscripts to be versioned, but also living. Uh, so here's what I mean. We did this Sci-Hub study, and we wrote in the first version, we estimate that over a six-month period, Sci-Hub provided access for 99% of valid incoming requests. Uh, it turned out we misunderstood some of the data. Sci-Hub tweeted about this. They read our preprint, which was cool. And in the second version, we said, in the first version of our study, we mistakenly treated the log events as requests rather than downloads. Fortunately, Sci-Hub reviewed the preprint and pointed out the error. Uh, so in this way, you can still get back to the old versions with the error, um, but 
we could also fix it because it's sort of a continuous system of publication. And in fact, right when we saw this tweet, we put a strike through, through all the lines that were affected by it. <laughs> and then, because it took us more time to figure out the, the better solution. Uh, here's a recommendation, which is for Manubot, but also more generally, whenever you're tracking prose or writing with Git, uh, there's a few ways you can uh, manage new lines within a paragraph. So the first is to not have any new lines or just put all the paragraph sort of in, in one big thing, which is fine in your text editor probably will wrap it. The second one is to do some sort of word wrapping such that a line never goes beyond 25 characters. And the third way is to do one sentence per line. Um, and now again, your text editor probably would wrap this, so it'd be easier to edit. Um, but we recommend one line per sentence. That helps um, of create the best git diff, so the best uh, changes between different versions, and minimizes conflicts. Conflicts are when two people edit the same line uh, at the same time, and it can be challenging to resolve. So it's best to avoid them. So a little bit on the current usage. Uh, we think there are about 40 public Manubot manuscripts. Uh, so the, uh, the first one was the Deep Review, which was a review article on deep learning and precision medicine. And we actually created the Manubot sort of to facilitate this project. Um, 27 different authors from 20 institutions got involved. Many of them heard about the project through social media and came on GitHub. They were not solicited in any way. And we think readers appreciate the breadth of perspectives this provided. So it was the most viewed bioarchive preprint of 2017 um, and has been cited many times even while it's in preprint stage. Another study was uh, the SciHub study, which I had mentioned, uh, which is an example of doing real-time open science. So all of our analysis was public. And this also happened to be the most viewed PRJ preprint of 2017. So while I don't think that was just because it used the Manubot, I think Manubot is a way that you can potentially quickly make papers on rapidly developing topics in an open way. Uh, and that was helpful here. Uh, so it's been used for undergraduate progress reports, grant progress reports, uh, climate data set publications. This is an interesting one. So notice this unreviewed work in progress. That's not in our uh, main template, but since Manubot is customizable, you can really change this if you have the technical abilities to whatever you want it to be. Uh, I should mention it's all an open source project. Uh, permissively licensed. Uh, data visualization projects for open source software. I think open source software, since all the contributors already know this workflow, is a great place for this to be used. Um, people have used it for sort of like their lab notebooks or to make personal literature reviews. Uh, for some genomics research papers, people have used it. And actually, I even cre recreated the Bitcoin uh, white paper using it. Uh, just to, as a proof of concept, but um, notice that it can do math. It, for people who like equations, it accepts the text, uh, the law tech math equations. So I guess I should say, if you haven't noticed by now, it's kind of more for technical users at this point. Uh, <laughs> 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 which, uh, uh, that's our target audience at this point. We hope a lot of these concepts obviously can be ported over to um, more general use products and um, maybe as they become more computational users, uh, this will find some market share. So you can get started at uh, Manubot Rootstock, uh, which is like the template you create and there's setup instructions which you should follow closely, but they should be complete. And uh, I would like to acknowledge other people who have been very active creators of this project. David Slowchower, Venkat Mulati, um, my uh, PI, Casey Green at University of Pennsylvania, and Anthony Gitter, as well as the users who have contributed on GitHub and uh, helped us with the deep review as sort of the initial users and our funding. Uh, initially, a lot of this was supported by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation in a grant to my 
uh, Advisor Casey, which was not just for Manubot, but more recently we have a uh, grant just for Manubot from the Sloan Foundation, uh, which means that uh, we need some developers and especially a front end developer, so please get in touch if you're interested. Um, so thank you. Um, first, uh, before we have a, a short discussion, um, we had a keynote that went a little bit over time, so we agreed with the other rooms that we have until five past, and so don't run all out. The next session starts 10 minutes past the hour, and we catch up with the time in the break, because it would be fair to him to have sort of lost 10 minutes uh, for his session, which was short anyway. So please go ahead with questions. I had two quick questions. Um, the first is around actually citation of the uh, papers that you're creating using Manubot themselves. One thing, I was looking at some of the, the meta paper, for instance, um, and I wondered whether you had functionality to make it easy for people to cite your paper um, uh, using the same sort of tools that you've got for making it easy to put citations and references in your paper. Um, and then the second thing is around your suggestion that uh, in an ideal world, what you're doing is linking to particular versions of things like diagrams and so on in other repositories. And I wondered what your thoughts there were for potential rot and breakage um, if the things you're linking to are no longer available. Do you have a way of checking whether the thing is still there in Manubot? Okay, great questions uh, for the first one. Uh, Manubot and Pandoc will fill out like uh, many of the HTML meta headers, so like author and title information is easy uh, to pick up. So if you were to do Manubot site and then a paper that was made with the Manubot via the URL, you would get a good looking reference. The only thing that's missing is it doesn't have what's called the container title or like journal name. Um, so we fill that in to Manubot preprint, but um, that currently doesn't make it into our uh, automatically extracted metadata. Uh, the second question is, uh, yeah, link rot is very interesting. Again, I, I always try to recommend version links, um, for example, for embedding images. So like if someone changes the GitHub repository and deletes a file, that embedding will still work. But I guess there's a bigger issue, say GitHub goes away. Um, there, there definitely can be some link rot. Uh, one thing you could have is the continuous integration to check all the links in a paper. Uh, and we do have the continuous integration do some checking. It doesn't do that checking currently, but it does do other things like uh, making sure all the citations are valid. If an archive paper has been published in a journal, it will uh, put a warning that maybe you want to switch the citations, stuff like that. So that's a good, a good feature suggestion. <laughs> Uh, hey, so uh, very cool. Um, two questions. Uh, first of all, the one thing that isn't open source that you have is, of course, GitHub itself. And Travis and, CI. Um, yeah. And Travis. So I'm wondering how hard, how hard would it be to port this to other Git uh, platforms? Um, so that would be question number one. And the second question is more technical. How easy did you find it to run Pandoc on a CI? Because I can see countless use cases uh, for that? Uh, yeah, so for the first question, um, that is sort of a concern. There is an issue open for porting it to GitLab, and I think people have gotten most of the way there. Uh, we started with GitHub just because it had the biggest user base. Uh, although for people who don't know, GitLab essentially has an open source implementation of the version control, like. Uh, system and the continuous integration, and I think that open source version would be suitable for the needs of this project. Uh, so that is, a, you know, something to think for the long term. Uh, the second question. Pandoc, how hard? To yes. Uh, so we use um, a Conda environment. Uh, Conda is like an environment manager, and that almost always has the latest version of Pandoc. Uh, so it's quite easy for us to get the latest Pandoc version. Do we have time for another question? 
Daniel, um, when I was writing my thesis in 2009 in Berkeley, I decided not to do it in Word because I knew it would be painful and to learn LaTeX for that. In the end, I spent more time um, learning LaTeX. I still feel like it was good to do because I spent more time, but at least it wasn't frustrating fighting with Word time. These 40 manuscripts, if you wrote them in Google Docs or Thorea or Microsoft Word, how long would it have taken to write them versus using Manybot? Well, at this stage, it would take a lot less time because everyone using Manybot is an early adopter. And obviously, especially in the past, you know, there are some uh, bugs that need to be ironed out. Even still, it probably would be faster to write it in Word or Google Docs. But what you're not going to get is the same open um, version control and history and that ability to really scale to such a collaborative um, and large size while maintaining like good um, access or like having peer review of, of potential additions to the paper. So yeah, I do think it probably is, I mean, even LaTeX, it takes longer to write in LaTeX than it does in Word. Um, I like Markdown a lot, but obviously having to use Git and make pull requests to make changes uh, or make commits to make changes does take longer. But I guess our argument is that the extra time is justified by the increased reproducibility and transparency in publishing. That's sort of a good segue into my question. And this um, has to do with when, when you sort of uh, uh, I see a paradigm shift in, in writing because you also, if you're writing with a tool like this, you're also, you can take advantage of, of this whole process of making commitments. And so in your use of it, do you see any uh, conventions emerging in um, your commit practices, how often you do it, how you um, denote different commitments, types of messages you put into, into your commits? Is that? Sort of yeah, make so some sense. good commit messages are important, and a good commit usually has sort of a singular focus. So um, I will try to do my writing where I'll address a single issue at a time. So rather than like doing one thing in one paragraph and working on another paragraph on a totally unrelated sort of enhancement or change, mm -hmm. I'll try to group them up just so that it has a more clear uh, history in that each commit has a more singular purpose. And, and was it in instances where you wanted to go back to do, how difficult was it to sort of do the navigation of your commits when you needed to? I'll sort of leave that hat hanging there. But. It's not too difficult for me, but it definitely can be difficult. And yeah, it's a, it, you do have to juggle things and have branches, yeah. We ran out of time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>